Remember Del Toro Quest? Of all the book series that are often known to get children hooked on reading, this was the first series that did it for me. The incredible monster designs on the covers, the puzzles and riddles littered throughout the books that actually made me pause reading to try to solve them on my own, the magic and adventure and mystery, everything about these books are just so nostalgic to me, and it may be well over a decade since I first read them, but I'm never gonna forget the incredible quest that is Del Toro Quest. Now let's rewind time for a moment. The year is 2005. I'm nine years old and addicted to Club Penguin, Pokemon, and Neopets. Oh my god, I forgot about my Neopets. Those guys are probably starving. Anyways, possibly the most magical time of the year came to my elementary school library, the Scholastic Book Fair. I was mesmerized at all the books and the cheap spy gadgets and cool pencils and eraser heads. Truly riveting stuff. This was a place of pure bliss. If you had a scholastic book fair at your elementary school, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Now obviously, I was drawn to all the copies of Goosebumps and Animorphs and Captain Underpants, but then my eyes locked on one book cover that grabbed all my attention. The cover featured this menacing knight holding his hand out as if commanding you not to open the pages of this book, which to any child is basically telling them to read it right away and discover its secrets. It promised adventure and danger. As it turned out, my school library had them in stock, so I spent hours and hours late into the night reading through this series. And admittedly some school hours reading sentence by sentence underneath my desk when I thought the teacher wasn't looking. It was that one scholastic book fair that changed everything and made me the reader I am today. Finding these books was a core memory and it's about time that I make a video talking about everything Del Toro Quest. Welcome to my very first Remember Reading video, a new series of videos on the channel where I'll be going over all the books we remember reading from our childhood. If you have a recommendation for a series you want to see me cover next, let me know in the comments. But real quick, this video is sponsored by Redbubble. Redbubble gives independent artists a brand new, meaningful way to sell their creations on a huge variety of everyday products. They have a ton of just unique and amazing designs. There's something for everyone. Now is the perfect time to buy some back to school gifts. Whether it's for your child or you're a student that wants some fresh new designs, Redbubble's got you covered. Now I picked out a bunch of products with a back to school theme that I'm excited to share with you guys. First off, I chose some t-shirts. This one here, I just thought had some summer vibes. This next one, I went with some self-expression. I love fantasy. And, and this one, and this one's got a sword on it. This moon song one, I just thought had a really eye-catching design. And this one, I just really liked the trippy text effect. You gotta grab people's attention. Uh, the next item that I picked up was this summer themed notebook. I got this as a gift for Katie. Uh, she's actually a school teacher, so she needs a lot of these. The next item is this purple geode drawstring bag that I picked out as a gift for my mom, but it would also work perfectly as a gift for a student as well because it's it's like a backpack. Now the next item I chose is this acrylic block. I've gotten a few of these from Redbubble and I just love them. I think they work really well as, as bookshelf decoration. The next item I got is for all the readers out there. This is a London bookshop art board. I just thought it was really cozy and I think it would work as good bookshelf decoration again, or you could even hang this on the wall. If you wanna get some back to school gifts or pick out some awesome designs for yourself, then make sure to use my unique promo code RBC-B22 dash captured in words to get 15% off your entire order. Also, you can check out the link in the description. It's a link to the favorite list of items that I created. So make sure to check that out. And thank you again to Redbubble for sponsoring this video. Del Toro Quest is a series of children's fantasy books written by Australian author Emily Rada with some fantastic memorable illustrations by Mark McBride. It's geared towards ages 8 to 14, but as many fans will say, it can easily be enjoyed by all ages. Now, I'll talk about whether I think it holds up later in the video. Book 1, The Forest of Silence, was first published in 2000 by Scholastic, and thankfully, readers wouldn't need to wait long for new installments, as Rada would drop a few books each year between 2000 and 2002. Aside from the eight books that make up the original series, there were two sequel series, Del Toro Shadowlands and Dragons of Del Toro. 
both of which I devoured as a kid. The sequel series are definitely worth it if you're a fan of the original because they're a continuation and there, there's some really good bangers in there, so you don't want to skip these. Now while you can buy each of the series in one big bind-up collection that's probably best for convenience sake, I prefer having all the individual paperbacks because you get all the amazing cover art. Which let's be honest, that was one of the huge appeals as a kid, seeing these covers in the bookstore or your school library. Also, on the spine of most of the paperbacks, it would add a gemstone to the belt on most of the books, and I always thought that was such a cool detail. But, one thing that bugs me way more than it probably should in these new like shiny editions which are pretty cool it doesn't there's no belts on the spine what i don't know what they were thinking i take this very seriously now there was some how to draw books and a quiz book and a ton of companion books the one that i had was tales of del Tora. i remember i always wanted my, to get my hands on the secrets of del Tora and especially the book of monsters I wanted that so bad. Now there were some spin-offs taking place in the same world, including The Star of Del Tora, The Three Doors, and Rowan of Rin. I never actually read any of those, so let me know in the comments if I should. Del Tora Quest went on to have an anime adaptation, which I'll be talking about later, as well as a manga, and there was also a Japanese exclusive Nintendo DS game. I'll talk about all of these in more detail later in the video, but now it's time we dive into the lore and story of the series. What is Del Tora Quest about? The magical land of Del Tora was originally split into seven different tribes made up of various races and groups, and each of the tribes was given the task of protecting a powerful gemstone. They worked together in relative peace until one day a man arrived in Del Tora who came to be known simply as the Shadow Lord. Yes, that's right, the Dark Lord of the series is simply called the Shadow Lord. This was the early 2000s. With this Sauron-like being came darkness and terrible monsters. He claimed an area as his own, which he called the Shadowlands, and together with his network of spies, along with his monstrous creations, including the horrifying Vral and the ferocious Akbaba, he invaded the lands of Del Tora. Now the arrival of Winter halted the Shadow Lord's invasion, and during this time, a blacksmith named Aiden had a dream about a belt that would unite the powerful gemstones that each tribe possessed. In secrecy, Aiden set out on a journey to each tribe and managed to convince them to add their sacred talisman to his belt. The people's trust in Aiden, channeled through the gems, was powerful enough to drive back the Shadow Army back into the Shadowlands. Though the battle was won, the enemy was never destroyed, and over time the history of these events faded to legend and myth and the power of the belt weakened just as the rulers of Del Tora weakened after a lengthy time of prosperity. Years and years later, the gems of Del Tora were stolen by the Akbaba under the power of the Shadow Lord and were scattered all throughout the land, allowing evil from the Shadowlands to once again corrupt the world. We follow Leaf, the son of a blacksmith, who on his 16th birthday is given the empty belt and sets out to fulfill his father's quest to restore the belt of Del Tora. Joining Leaf is a former palace guard and friend to the family, the stoic and stern Barda. Now during their first adventure in the Forest of Silence, they meet a wild girl living in the woods named Jasmine, who can speak to trees and animals, and she has companions of her own, a raven named Cree and an odd furry puffball creature named Philly. Together, Leaf Barda and Jasmine, and her companion creatures, set out to recover the seven gems, each of which have a unique power, and are each hidden in ominous locations all around Del Tora, that happen to be guarded by some form of monstrous guardian. These three unlikely companions form a pretty strong bond with each other over time as they have to face numerous challenges and perils, they have to slay monsters, make allies, and solve puzzles in order to survive. That's the main premise in a nutshell. Every one of the books follows a certain formula. The heroes travel for a while before finding a new location that was corrupted by the Shadow Lord. They run into some enemies, they usually have to solve some sort of puzzle or riddle, they find new allies, they discover where the gem is, and then they have to go and face the big boss, the guardian of the gem. And one thing I like is that it's not entirely episodic. There are some plot threads that carry through throughout the series, so you do need to read them in order. 
Now it is incredibly impressive that Rada manages to make this world feel so big and lived in. Each new location that our trio travels to feels unique. Not only does Del Toro feel big, but there's also mentions of lands far away, and even the place that the Shadow Lord came from. And it's surprising to see a world that feels so big and complex in a children's fantasy series that's relatively short. Del Tora and its environments truly do feel like they've been corrupted by evil. There's an overwhelming sense of dread and gloom that permeates through the fantastical land. You get the feeling that if the Shadow Lord had his way much longer, then there wouldn't really be any good left. Leaf is raised in a city outside the palace where communication has been cut off and the people are slowly dying of hunger. Monsters are everywhere and even traveling down the road poses danger. And one thing these books do really well is adding a creeping sense of suspense and small little moments of horror. Now this is a kid series, I'm not talking about Stephen King horror, but some of the most successful fantasy stories out there have some moments of horror to them. Whether it's the creeping hand of a Barrow White, or the terrifying moment that drums start to beat deep within the minds of Moria, or the moment that Jeff Bezos, your defense against the dark arts teacher, removes moves his turban to reveal that Voldemort has taken up residency on the back of his head. Adding small moments of horror like this adds a lot more suspense to the danger that the protagonist faces, and it does wonders to keep a reader glued to the page. Minor spoiler, but I vividly remember being shocked at the horror of uh, the, the quicksand pit scene with, with Jin and Jod when you realize they were speaking backwards. And the shifting sands and the slug cave terrified me as a kid, and I haven't even mentioned uh, the sequel series with the underground, especially the scene with the leeches. Also, the spider island scene. There's a lot of scenes like this that really stuck with me. I'm gonna get you. It always felt like there's a lurking feeling in the back of your head that something is wrong here, there's some uneasiness, and then sure enough, the characters are thrown into danger. As far as themes and lessons go, you got the basic stuff like teaching kids about teamwork and patience, but then you have some more relevant things regarding politics and gambling and environmentalism. It even has a subtle social commentary on rulers becoming weaker after several years of prosperity, which, you know, a lot of these are pretty relevant now. Does it hold up? After rereading, I'm not gonna pretend that it's as amazing as I thought it was when I was a kid. Uh, but, I still did really enjoy it. And yeah, sure, some nostalgia is probably at play there, but even so, I just thought it was a really fun series. Obviously, you can't go comparing it to some big, epic, adult fantasy series. This is made for children, and the characters are pretty surface level. They don't have a ton of depth to them, they don't grow a whole lot near the end of the series, though I did really enjoy seeing how they would bond and grow closer to each other throughout the books. Very few situations actually resolve in violence. Oftentimes the travelers will have to overcome some type of puzzle or riddle to get past obstacles. And I think this is a good, a good thing for children to kind of teach them, you know, not to always resort to violence to overcome their obstacles. And I enjoyed how the trio would use trickery and just their observation skills and intellect to get out of situations. The plot is fairly straightforward, it's, it's formulaic, so I think if you're reading them back to back, sometimes the formula will get a little bit old, but the ending did kind of surprise me. And there's actually a lot of just twists and turns throughout this series that are gonna surprise you. I was surprised at just how dark this world really is, like pretty much everything is out there to kill the protagonist. There's monsters everywhere, uh, and the protagonists are not they're not invincible. I mean, they can barely take on four Grey Guards at once, and they often have to use trickery to escape. The suspense, the twist, and the mystery, I think are things that older readers are gonna appreciate. Moving on to adaptations, Del Toro Quest became extremely popular in Japan, and in 2007, it was adapted into an anime by OLM, the people responsible for Pokemon, Yokai Watch, as well as Berserk. And I had no idea this anime existed when I was a kid, otherwise I'd be freaking out. The anime spanned 65 episodes, 52 of which covered the main canon of the 8 original books. The last 13 episodes were extra filler that added in new, never-before-seen stories. Though the English dub chose to scrap those 13 episodes altogether and ended it where the books did. And the dub for the show began airing on Cartoon Network in Australia and New Zealand in May 2010. 
The visuals are pretty standard, and in some ways they kind of remind me of the original Full Metal Alchemist series in terms of the style. However, the most striking choice was to use CGI for the Seven Gem Guardians. Now, a lot of people are not going to like this. I think it makes them stand out much more than just your average goon, and it didn't really bother me. Now, in a lot of ways, this was incredibly faithful to the books. A lot of the small details are included here. One obvious detail that was changed is that Leaf is now blonde, but I don't think that really matters too much. Some of the dialogue is word for word, from the books. I do think it's worth watching if you're a fan of the books, however, it does have some problems, specifically when it comes down to the oversimplifying of some of the morals and dumbing down the intelligence of the characters. Also, the world is just much more lighthearted and it's missing that overwhelming sense of gloom and dread uh, that the books had. Now, apparently, Del Toro Quest was so popular in Australia that it actually came into some of the education systems. Some schools would read the books and then go and watch the anime. That's right, anime was part of the Australian education system. Why was my school so lame? There was also a 10 volume manga. Now I'm having a hard time figuring out if this came out before the anime or after the anime. But anyways, in 2011, it finally got an English translation. Now moving on to games, Del Toro Quest The Seven Gems was a Japanese exclusive game on the Nintendo DS that released back in 2007. This RPG featured a stylus-based combat system where tapping, swiping, and even blowing into the microphone will perform various different attacks. The player got to choose between Leaf Barda and Jasmine, all of which had slight differences in their gameplay and their unique special attack. The game was broken into chapters named after the main books, and it featured nine main levels with various extra levels. And it even had a collectible card game where players could use the wireless communication feature to share cards with each other and share their notes. As far as other games, there's not really much. There was a fairly basic match three game which could be played for free on Cartoon Network, which was inevitable since the series revolved around gems. But I remember playing some of the Flash games on the Scholastic website. Each of them uh, had you doing some challenge to receive one of the seven gems. And they were, there was a pretty bad, you know, parkour game with a terrible jumping mechanic that I painfully remember playing since I was desperate for anything Del Toro Quest. Uh, but I specifically remember playing the Maze of the Beast game where you had to make your way through the maze without getting caught by Gloss. I feel like I'm the only one that actually played these games. Let me know if you did. Apparently, there was even a Del Toro Quest board game, The Battle to Save Del Toro. Now, from what I've read online, it wasn't really that good, but I figured I'd mention it anyway. These books will always mean a lot to me, and I'm sure they did for a lot of other people as well. As it turns out, my friend Cam from Wolf the Story Nomad made an incredible video on Del Toro Quest that you should definitely check out. And since he also grew up reading them, I wanted to reach out to Cam to hear about his experience. If I can say one thing about Del Toro Quest, it's this. It's way better than The Wheel of Time, and, in fact, it makes those books look like garbage, dude. No, God, no. I'm kidding. <laughs> look, Del Toro Quest is special to me for quite a few reasons, but you're not watching a Captured in Words video to see my big ass forehead, so I'll keep it brief. My love for reading fantasy today can be attributed almost entirely to this series. So I happen to live in the flaming spider's nest down under called Australia. Yeah, g'day and all that. I live in Australia, so the fact that the author Emily Rotter was a fellow Aussie and the fact that she wrote those books for kids like me. I mean, when I was a kid, I, I know I'm not a kid now. It's not important. It meant a lot to me. The fantastically flawed characters of Del Toro Quest, and more importantly, the bond that they forged over an enormous journey, made me feel like I was a part of it. And the reason is because that was literally the first fantasy series that I ever read. Think about the first fantasy series that you ever read. Not the first fantasy book, just the first series. The first time that you followed a long adventure with a character or characters over multiple books. That feeling, experiencing that for the first time, it's indescribable and it's something that fantasy fans never forget. Look, I don't want to get too corny, but I will. Del Toro Quest will forever be iconic to me, not just because of the amazing book covers, but because of the path that it put me on. If it weren't for this amazing series, I wouldn't have found The Hobbit, Percy Jackson, 
the never-ending story. Del Toro Quest was my gateway into the thing that shaped what I want to do with my life, writing fantasy books. And I cannot thank Emily Rodder enough. Uh, also, the monsters are sick, dude. I actually reread this series as an adult, and Glass from Maze of the Beast scared the panties off me. Anyway, just read it. Um, are you subscribed to Captured in Words yet? Uh, okay, well then how about you go ahead and do it? Otherwise I'll start bottling up all of the spiders that I'm getting rounding up in the back garden there. That There's a lot of them. And I will literally ship them to you in the mail. There's some, <laughs> some pretty big ones. Seriously, the spiders are big. You should listen to what he says. Also go check out Cam's channel. His videos are, on are honestly so good. Like, he's funnier than me. He makes amazing videos, and I feel like his channel just deserves so much more love, so go check it out. That is it for this video. Let me know in the comments if you remember Del Toro Quest. I'm curious to know how many other people read it growing up. Also, if you have any recommendations for what series you want to see me cover next in the next Remember Reading video, then let me know in the comments. And as always, a big thank you to my patrons.